see, he needs more volume up there, I think. All right, thanks for being on time. Uh, well, seems like just yesterday we were in the Ellen Davis Fieldhouse. How many of you were there last summer? There's an ABBA song I can still recall last summer. I'll play that for you later. Um, how many people were not there last summer? Okay, so we have a number of new folks. It's been a great year in many respects, and this is the time of year where we need to reflect, I think. Reflection leads to learning, where we can reflect on the year and then talk about what we need to do going forward. So today is a day of reflection. We'll do a little bit of training that you haven't seen before, but not much. And over the summer days that you have, I hope you have that summer schedule, we're going to do a lot of training and, be, and retraining and being redundant because I think it means more now that you can do uh, a rigorous instructional program for a year. The training might mean a little bit different. You might see different things and we have a number of new folks anyway that we have to uh, coach. So, but today we're going to spend most of the day just reflecting on the year. Uh, and I want to start, uh, you may have seen this video clip, but whenever you've gone through something tough, uh, there is a sense, hopefully, of satisfaction. The question is, how do you celebrate? And what does it really mean? I'm getting good here. Oh, yes. That's going to be your third input here, Alex. Is it on? Yeah. It's probably the mix out of his computer.
two questions. Was it as easy as it looked? And two, how are you going to celebrate? Why don't you turn to your partner and talk about that for a moment? Answer those two questions in your partner. Divisions, 
each with the academic median that was congruent or similar. So it wasn't geographic. The, the five divisions have several feet of panels each. And yes, we had to uh, go to um, split up the fourth division uh, and spread out the street of panels. But the district is still in five divisions. We're going to keep five divisions. And then we had an executive director over each feeder pad. An assistant soup over each division, an executive director over each feeder pad. The purpose of that was to ensure that we had a faster and greater implementation of the reform initiatives. And so that's uh, what we said we were going to do. It would also help us increase accountability for actually implementing and following through on the reforms. Um, and it helped us focus on instruction. So we think we did that fairly well, that those of that, that structure with that coaching seemed to work. Obviously some lessons learned. Uh, I know that one of the comments from some of the principals has been, um, sometimes the implementation is uneven. In other words, in this feeder pattern, it may look this way, and in this feeder pattern, there's slightly different rules or requirements, and each feeder pan is slightly different. And that's true, we'll get better at calibration. There will always be a little bit of difference um, because we're not requiring everybody to do it exactly the same way, just like schools. You have broad parameters, but each high school is going to be a little bit different in how they implement different things. There's some things that should be standardized, and that's what we have to get better at. That calibration. So that's one of the lessons learned. And actually, we knew that would happen. We just have to make sure that we calibrate even better. Um, and then we have a couple executive director vacancies, which we will be filling. Um, and one of the lessons learned is that executive directors play a huge, important role in this kind of structure. I mean, if we didn't have this kind of structure, we had a, 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 a less a, hierarchical structure, I guess, they may not be uh, as key, but they're critical because they coach the principles of the feeder pattern. So we need to have an executive director in waiting. We have to have an executive director who can step right in if an executive director leaves, gets promoted, or, or goes off. Okay. So that's another lesson learned. Next steps, we will have an executive director um, evaluation system starting this coming year. We'll conduct more calibration using the 2012-2013 data. That data is being analyzed as we speak. We need to strengthen the feeder pattern identity. Uh, we want kids who start in their elementary schools to get to the middle schools and, and, and not go somewhere else and then go to the high schools. We need to grow that identity. And we need to be a little bit more purposeful about that as a feeder pattern, as a district. Um, and then we need good succession planning and training for senior leadership. When they do the um, assistant suits, executive directors, and cabinet figures. Yeah, right, okay. School Isn't leadership and construction, that's what we said we were going to do. The question is, did we accomplish that? Until then. Um, yeah. I have an opinion, I just talked about my opinion. I think we accomplished that to a great degree. I think for the most part it worked. Uh, and we're going to stick with that structure next year. But take a minute, talk to your colleagues about that structure, talk about how it was uh, successful or not successful, and then when you're done discussing with your colleagues, just circle one of the ten bullets. Cover his ass from the principal to say, well, we didn't 
Well, I'm serious, well, here it is. Like, I talked about it here. That's what they did with the person already. They already told it. So what they said is the best thing. This definitely has to be important no matter what. That's why this is more important. Yeah, it, but it's... it's It's like, uh, what do you call it? Yeah. 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 yeah, I figured you say, somebody can say, yeah, I'm going to take a break, and then you show up and I was there for five minutes, and I just got three minutes at the start. And I got it, Alex, and then see, that doesn't look good on paper. That's not my boss, though. Bet, bet you go beyond that. You have to think about it. You know, it's the case. It's the case. It's the case. It's the case. He's better than that. No, he's better than that. He's a girl. He's a girl.
principles that are new. I don't know if that's good or bad, um, but I think it's the, for the 65 we're picking, I've, I've met a lot of them, and I'm excited about the ones we're hiring. Lesson learned. We have to get in our own mindset the paradigm is a continuous improvement model. It's not just one evaluation. It does start now. It starts in the summer and we grow. We have to get into your head, into our own head, that progressing and improving are okay. So this year there was a big brouhaha over people being placed on improvement plans. We knew that would happen, but that the intent was not to, to use that as a way to get rid of somebody. In fact, um, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand, but many of you in this room were placed on a proven plant and just improved. And we should be okay with being placed on an improvement plan as long as that improvement plan doesn't equal, equate to, you're done. So we have work to do to make sure that it doesn't look like when you get an improvement plan, oh, well, that you might as well go look for another job. That's not the case. It didn't happen this year. Yes, some people on improvement plans to get removed. That's true. But there are many others who got placed on improvement plans and they weren't removed. We're going to start improvement plans a lot earlier. We couldn't last year, this last school year. It wouldn't have seemed fair, at least it didn't seem fair to me, if we placed somebody on an improvement plan in October because they hadn't gotten really used to some of the uh, spot observations, the visits from EDs, the mid-year reviews, all that other stuff. We hadn't even done mid-year reviews. So it, didn't, it seemed a little premature. Now, however, now that people have been used to the, the instructional priorities, action planning, etc., some people might be placed on improvement plans in, in October so that they can improve by March or something like that. So the improvement plan will really be the improvement plan and not be so scary uh, a way of um, helping someone, of coaching. So that's a lesson learned, that's something we have to continue to work on. Uh, there is a couple cases we have to figure out, you know, it is true that we're all different in how we, how we perceive instruction. Now for the most part, if we calibrate well, it's going to be fine. Uh, but there, there are some times where somebody has a, an issue with an evaluator, and in those cases where it's really difficult, relationship, we need to have a little bit of review so that we can make sure that our system is as fair as possible. So we're going to think about that, how we do that, um, without going crazy on it. And then the last lesson learned is, uh, while a lot of data was presented, we didn't present enough data in a form that people can understand, to, um, so that people could understand where the school was in its progress. So we're going to do that in a better way. We're going to have to use your. We're going to have to get your help to do that, so that we give the right information to all of our parents. Next steps is to tie the principal evaluation to strategic compensation. We did not do that this year. Um, the focus group talked about it, and we're going to talk more about uh, tying your evaluations to. Um, a compensation plan that rewards success and um, and values and pays people for what we value most. We're going to continue our training with executive directors and we already talked about the continuous improvement model. So that's what we plan to do. We'll have the same evaluation system so no big changes there. Um, we'll have the same sort of coaching, so not a lot of new for next year. We've learned some lessons about it, but overall I think the principal evaluation system has been successful. But I'd actually like to hear from you, so take a couple minutes, talk to your colleagues about your experiences this year, um, and then when you're done, talk with your colleagues, just circle one of the bullets, and we'll collect those again at the end. Again, you don't need to put your name on these.
talk to questions now. Looks like this is where he's going to take the questions. Two masters. That was fun. So I'm thinking this is going to be over by 11 30. But Mike's going to call me, but I don't want to be over there. Then I got to do the survey. How many, how many survey calls did you make? How many did you get 30? I got the first pay. That's not a good I mean, filled out and highlighted? Or was it not a. Rebecca here? Rebecca? 
communications. Because last year we did it, Jennifer was here. I'd be pretty good with a manual zoom. Well, that tells me we don't need Tim at all. We can do away with the whole department and give, give ourselves raises. Uh, how, do you like that idea? All right. Again, this is a big level view. You're, you'll do your school level when you get to these breakouts. So, for this next one, top talent for senior leadership positions. Uh, I said that I would bring in top ta talent to help run the district and also help be senior leadership. And so, I've in the presentation this summer, this is the first draft of it, I'll have two, two pictures. Um, one is the, the cabinet in, in, uh, in September or August, where I'm sitting with about eight cabinet members at a table doing our thing. And then the second picture will just have me and one other person uh, sitting there doing our thing. Now, the, the media, and some of you got it, the rest of you are like, what is he talking about? It's good you're not reading the paper. You're doing your work. You're getting the, the stuff done. Because the media makes you know, a big deal out of the panel. But, you know, senior leadership involves a whole bunch of people. So if you're an executive director in Dallas IC, would you stand up, executive director? Stand up. Look at these people. I'm not kidding, we've got some of the best and brightest executive directors, especially with regard to instruction um, in Texas and even outside of Texas. And if you're an assistant superintendent, would you please stand up? <laughs> also, nationally known folks, uh, I mean, we brought great senior leadership, and of course, um, Dr. Randall, would you please stand? <laughs> I'm not sure if I, is, is there another, any other chiefs here today? <coughs> Dr. Smisco? Oh, and Dr. Smisco. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, um, if, you, if you look across the, the district, and I know we just have school leadership here, but we also have great people doing work, executive directors, directors in human capital management, in uh, our operations, in finance. We've brought a lot of folks, some internal, some external. Uh, but one of the lessons learned is that for the cabinet, at least, if I had to do it all over again, to have a good blend of internal and external, and a good blend of experience versus non-experience. Um, you need fresh blood, that's true, so that you don't get stale. You need a different perspective sometimes and borrow from other places and how people have done it over there. But you also need that history and institutional knowledge and you need people who have been through the fire. Um, you know, it's tough in, uh, in, in this district in some places, uh, especially being on the cabinet, and so you need people with that kind of, um, they've been hardened like steel, right? They've been through the fire. So um, that's a lesson learned, and you'll see that in the cabinet coming forward for 2013-2014. Uh, the next steps, we will reorganize the cabinet, and we're also going to do a 360 review. This year we're, get, we're only going to start with the cabinet and possibly the assistant superintendents, and then in the future we'll do it with executive directors. The 360 is where we have a survey 
of the leadership team and not, it's not just a survey, it's a, it's a survey and other questions about the leadership team from their subordinates so that they get input from the subordinates, their colleagues, and their supervisors. A 360 review. That'll be done by an independent professional company that does that review. That way we continue to grow so that we can develop our own senior leadership skills. So take a second, talk to your colleagues about your senior leadership in the district, whether we were able to bring in some good talent or not, and then circle one of the bullets. And I know there's some, you know, there's some discussion about this, and it's, it only just started this year, It'll get better, but uh, human capital management re reorganized into a case manager system, and hopefully they've been much more responsive to your needs for teachers. There's also been many more teacher job fairs, and we're going to continue that through the summer. And again, cut them a little bit of slack of just starting this, but hopefully that process has already worked a little bit better. And that's from what I've heard, it has uh, it has worked much better than in years past as far as getting teachers in that are qualified. So we need to grow that, we need to help in capital management to get even stronger uh, with that. We also expanded the Teach for America program. Uh, this year we will have about 180 new Teach for America teachers um, that will join the 120 some that are already here. And let's see, oh, in the with the initial uh, start of the School Leaders Academy, the Principal Fellows Program, we think that was very successful. We hired 55 people to go through that program. 20 some of them are principals, um, will be new principals. In fact, if we're already, stand up. If you're a new School Leaders Academy fellow principal, please stand up. And then we hired a whole bunch of other non school leader academy internal and external uh, folks from around the area and around the country, uh, another 25 or so of those. So if you're a new principal who's not a fellow, would you please stand up? Thank you. Thank you. This is a good group. New principals um, who had been put through their paces. I don't know if you know that much about the principal selection model. Not only was there a rigorous screening, but they all had to go through performance interviews. And the performance interviews had an in basket test, they had to look at data, they had to do other exercises, they had to watch film. I mean, it was pretty uh, rigorous. They made it past that, and then they had to go through yet more interviews. So, um, rigorous process, we're very excited about that. But that's what our profession requires. We need anybody who's entering the system to be top notch, and we think we've got some top notch folks. Uh, so, that was part of the uh, part of our efforts was recruiting teachers and recruiting principals. The, the lessons learned around that, and you know, we've got a long way to go, we can't turn the ship overnight. Uh, we know we need bilingual teachers. That's the biggest need area. We also know that we have to keep working on the quality of our teaching staff, especially the recruitment pool. Um, and then we, we also have to look closely at our substitutes. Probably the biggest concern I, when I go around, principals talk to me about uh, substitute teachers. Either long-term subs in some cases, but in, in many cases, not about the long term, so it's about the, just the everyday substitute. It's almost, in some cases, like babysitting. Uh, they're not as skilled to teach and follow a, a good lesson plan. Not, I'm, I'm painting everybody with the same brush, and I don't mean to do that, in some cases. So we know that we, that's an area that we have to work on, and we've got a, a plan to try to move forward in that, in that area. 
So the next step, we're increasing the stipend for bilingual teachers. We have to look at the stipends for some other areas. And we have to change the compensation plan for the teachers and their evaluation system. Okay, so that's, that all takes some time. It also takes some money. So we're investing little by little into our teaching uh, pool. All right, that's, those are the lessons learned. Talk, about, talk to your colleagues, because you're the ones on the ground. And uh, talk to them about the recruitment of teachers and principals in the district. Were we able to accomplish anything? Did we move the ball down the field on that? Or are we way, way behind still? So talk to your colleagues about that and then circle the bullet. Let me know. All right. You know, I, I know uh, the district has had some scar tissue around their financial situation. And um, I know we, in the state legislature the last couple of years, not this year, but a couple of years, the district lost $100 million over two years in state revenue because of the bad economy and things like that. So one of the one of the main things we needed to work on as a senior leadership team was to make sure that we uh, maintain the progress toward a good, stable financial situation. And just looking at some of these bullets, I hope you agree that we made considerable progress on that. First of all, the fund balance at the end of this year, unassigned fund balance is going to be two hundred and thirty million dollars. So you can see where it has been and where we are today. Two hundred and thirty million in unassigned fund balance, two hundred and fifty two two hundred and fifty five million in fund balance. Then the question is so is that a lot? Is that not a lot? Is it good? Is it bad? What do you think? And the answer is 230 million unassigned fund balance is a good fund balance because we don't have to borrow money to make payroll uh, so that we don't have to pay the interest on that. So that's good. In fact, we reached that point when we hit 190 million in our fund balance. We don't have to borrow any money to make payroll. It's a cash flow issue. And then the second thing is do you have three months of operating revenue in the bank just in case something bad happens and you need to spend that money? Uh, and the answer is, in order to get three months of operating revenue that's really solid, we should eventually get to 300 million. But well, we're no longer in a real rush to do that because we hit 190 million back in August, September time frame. Now we're at 230. We don't have to grow the fund balance as much. That means we can invest the money in our schools. So that's a good thing. We can now invest more money in the programs and people that we need. You know, the district was in a different situation three years ago. It needed to grow its fund balance. You're wasting money if you have to borrow money to make payroll. Um, so we're in a very good situation with that. We also have met E-rate compliance this year, so we're no longer in E-rate jail, as they call it. And that means, what that means is, uh, it's still going to take a little bit of time, but it means that we have about $130 million that will be freed up over time that we should have been getting over the last five years, six years. Um, we have not been getting that money, and we now we're able to get, start to get access to it. So that's going to add to our technology need, which we haven't been able to invest properly yet. Um, but we've done some other things, uh, especially around staff and employees. I know. You know, it's never enough because we need to make sure that our salaries, not just your salary, but our teachers and staff in particular, get higher salaries. They deserve a higher salary. This year we were able to give a stipend, it wasn't a lot of money, but it was something, in October uh, for staff. I don't know if you remember that. Uh, it came and went, just like that. And we got no credit for it, we just got beat up. It wasn't enough. Okay, fine. We just brought to the board a budget. We'll see if it passes on Thursday next week. A 2% increase uh, for teachers and a 2% for staff. 
And, and this should not go unnoticed, guys. We are contributing to healthcare costs, um, you know, contributing to the, the district's contribution towards healthcare for the first time in six years. The district is going to be contributing $615,000 a month. That's real money. If you saw it on the ground, you'd probably pick it up. <laughs> you know? So, that's, it's not going to help everybody, but for most people, depending on your plan, right? It depends on your plan. It's going to help considerably. We, we cannot fix health care costs in the state of Texas. But what we can do is try to contribute a little bit to this to employees so that it's not a runaway train for most of them. So, and some people are going to have to migrate to a different plan to save some money. That's, that's the intent too. But in the end of the day, we're contributing. So, we are contributing about $30 million to employees with regard to salaries and benefits this year. So, that's a, that's a good thing. That is a, that is a good thing. And we've been able to do it and still maintain a $230 million uh, fund balance. So, um, again, we'll be able to grow next year, um, but we're going to invest a lot more into the classrooms and programs. So, lessons learned. Um, we do have to get a handle on our vacancies. Uh, one of the reasons why the fund balance grows uh, is when you have vacancies that are not filled. And so we need to make sure that when we have those positions, and, it, and I think Human Capital Management has done a great job. This year, by this point last year, we had filled about 89% of all known vacancies. We're at 94%. So that 5% of the point makes a huge difference. Are we done? No, we're not even close to done. We'll be done in August or September, and then we'll have to do the leveling, but still, we've made a good whack at that, and we need to keep that in mind. Um, and then that second bullet there, I, I already talked about, but we don't need to grow the fund balance by $50 million next year. You know, even though we won't be at $300 million yet, we don't need to grow by $50 million. We can grow by another 10 or 20 at the, at the, at the most so that we can invest in you, in the schools, in the teachers, in the other programs. We're going to grow, but we're going to grow more slowly. The fund balance is going to be better. All right, before I go any further, talk to your colleagues about that real quick. Um, you know, I know it looks different when you're at the school level, because you, you, know, you don't get to see the district level monies and things. What you really see is what, what you have in your schools. And so it's okay, give me your perspective on the financial situation in the district. This was, uh, apart from the principal eval, principal effectiveness initiative, I, in the leadership team, said we, we were going to improve the quality of instruction, or at least focus on instruction. We know it's too big a district to turn on a dime, so the question is can we move it and can we identify what high quality instruction looks like and means, and can we get movement in that direction? So that's one of the things we said we were going to do. Um, we started, in order to do that, we accomplished, I think, the, the beginnings of a culture of instructional feedback. And when you get to the breakout sessions, I want to ask you about that for your school, but as a district, we wanted to start this culture of instructional feedback uh, at many different levels. Uh, we worked on not everything related to high quality instruction, but on a few things that are related to high quality instruction. Good lesson objectives, good demonstrations of learning, purposeful um, aligned instruction, and then multiple response factors, which is part of student-teacher engagement. So we started working on that. We did a number of spot observations and uh, how to conduct good, provide good, effective instructional feedback. And those are the things I think we accomplished across the district. Think about 
the number of spot observations and instructional feedback forms that you gave to teachers. Think about 10,000 teachers or 9,800 classroom teachers uh, or so, and the number of instructional feedback forms or sessions each one of them had on average. That's a whole bunch of instructional feedback, a whole bunch of spot observations. And this district, with this group here, was able to do um, that to great effect this year, in just one year. I think that's a heavy lift, and, and we got that accomplished. Some lessons learned, uh, again, consistency and implementation. Even in this room, we're looking at folks that I know did some instructional feedback really, really well, and then other folks who did it a little bit less well. And there's some differences in the school. We, we're going to allow for some of those differences. We set broad parameters, but we need all of us to continue to calibrate with our EDs and amongst ourselves and PLCs so that we have effective instructional feedback that, that's consistent across the district. So the same thing goes for some of the EDs who are coaching principals, principals who coach teachers, we have to try to have some consistency in the implementation. That's one lesson learned. Um, and then we need to provide many, many more examples of proficient um, feedback, what it looks like, and continue to show models to all the principals, of other principals giving good feedback. More role plays, more video clips, of how to give effective instructional feedback and bring that culture. More models of good spot observations um, so that people can, can get on the same page. I required three things, if you remember, on the instructional feedback forum, and even this was a little inconsistent in how it played out. One, you had to have a validating comment, right? You have to validate, validate, validate. In other words, catch people doing good things and going and finding something positive or something that go, that's working well. And that should always be on the spot observation form. The second thing was some uh, question or comment that invites reflection. So it's not accusatory, it's just a question. I want you to think about it. I wonder why. That should be on your spot observation form. And the third thing is helpful here. Because I've found, and it worked this year too, those principals who did those three things on their spot observation form, they validated, they asked reflective questions, and third, they gave a helpful hint, something that is useful, that made teachers feel good about that sort of feedback. Even if they got 20 of those spot observations, they felt good about that because it was helpful. As a group, this group did very well. Their surveys, uh, looking at the surveys, most teachers feel that the, the instructional feedback was effective. And most teachers feel that the quality of the instruction improved. Now, I haven't looked at the results of the system, uh, systems review surveys. I know that's being compiled, it's being finished up. So I won't know for sure what the administration thinks, uh, the school leadership team thinks we grew with regard to quality of instruction. My own anecdotal information is that quality instruction improved tremendously from the beginning of the year to the end of the year. Um, and the teachers believe that according to the surveys and the instructional feedback was effective according to, the feed, uh, according to the survey. So this group did a great job on this. Next steps, uh, we continue, we have to use data in a much more targeted fashion. We're gonna perfect the data team meeting, so those will continue, we'll just get better at that. Uh, and then, we're going to uh, enlist the assistance, greater assistance from academic facilitators and instructional coaches. Instructional coaches at the building level, academic facilitators at the district level, uh, division level. So that's our plan moving forward. So you're not going to see a lot of differences in the um, quality of construction. We're going to continue to do feedback forms. Going to continue to monitor, they're still going to do mid year reviews and, and use instructional coaches. So, talk to your neighbor about quality of instruction this year. We'll ask you again in the breakout sessions about your school, but just as a district wide, how does it seem quality of instruction? 
Did we make any progress on that? All right, just a couple more. Student achievement. Student achievement is, in the end of the day, what we need to improve. If we can't do that as a group, uh, then we are not doing right by our kids. They come to school to learn. They come to school to get more proficient. So in the end of the day, we have to have that. Now, we know that in a transformative time, um, you have to consider that transformation when you're trying to um, get student achievement results. Indeed, in many big organizations, that it's going to require a huge amount of change. If you're a change, if you read change theory, you might even have an implementation dip. Well, luckily, we were able to avoid an implementation dip, and actually, uh, in overall, our student achievement is up. Especially in the three through eighth grades, we had achievement gains, uh, very nice achievement gains, except for in writing overall. And but in the other areas, we're up. In the high school, the end of course exams, we had a couple that were up and a couple that were down, but nothing significant either way. So uh, across the board, we had pretty good achievement. The one area that was really alarming, or at least negative, was sixth grade. And so we're going to spend some time analyzing that. We have an idea. Um, but sixth grade was the tough area. Eighth grade, on the other hand, was double-digit increases in several subjects, and for a district this size, that's that's very tough to do. So middle schools had that mixed group. Elementary was up. EOC was uh, mixed also, up and up and down, but not by large margins. Um, the only large margin was in middle school. Sixth grade down, eighth grade up. So um, that's our student achievement history for this year. We're gonna, we'll, when we get back from, the, from your break, we're going to go over um, metrics by school and the breakouts and as a district uh, once we get a chance to compile that and, and tie that to your evaluations. Our growth area is writing. And the other big student achievement lesson, we are spending way too much time testing but it's not the star in the ACP that is taking it most of the time. It is practicing for the test. It is testing for the tests. It's all the other tests and practice exams. We're doing way too much of that. We have to have teachers who are teaching up until the star exam and then up into the ACP. It is not a good thing for kids to spend the whole month of February reviewing the same things if they are to do those things. I had a personal experience with this, with my, and I don't want to point out just one school, but I'm going to have to, uh, there's going to be a new principal there. Marsh Middle School, my son, sixth grade, you know, spent the whole month of February reviewing things that he didn't need to review and reviewing things that that were a waste of his time for over a month and taking tests for over a month that he didn't need now he scored 100 on both the math star and the reading star so 100 percent so yes he's a little, he's a bright little kid but still there are other kids who were also wasting their time. We need to look at that very closely. When I hear from the community way too many assessments, and we cut down the number of assessments, by the way, at the district level, right? Not every six weeks, those are voluntary. ACPs are not, and the STAR is not. We cut down on a lot of assessments, not all of them. But what we did cut down is all the practice tests, and that's up to the schools. So we're gonna, we're gonna talk about that next year. And we're going to try to get better at that. Next steps is strength and effective use of time in the school day. Um, we know that kids need more time. On, on achievement, 
on academic proficiency, some of our kids need more time. And either we will gain that time during the school day by good use of scheduling, or we have to add time either before or after school or in the summer. So we're going to think about how to do that well without you know, killing the schools and, what, and the teachers, but we have to really look at the instructional time that our kids are getting, the instructional minutes kids get. That's what we have to look at. All right, so think about academic achievement just broadly. We're going to get a breakout session in a, session, in, a, in a minute. Think about academic achievement broadly and talk to your neighbor about that. <laughs>